I'm Janita Prevost. Welcome to Power Presence Position. Thank you, Eleanor, for having me. I'm so excited to be here. I want to jump up and down. <laughs> I know, right? I, this is this is so much fun. And we we literally had to like shut down our green room conversation because we were having so much fun. Um, and like, look, we got to get around to recording a podcast here. <laughs> Let's Absolutely. do it. So one of the things that you are known for and that we're going to be talking about and sharing um, some insight and expertise around is this idea of, of lucrative networking and, and the ability to build and leverage networks to create income, impact, all that good stuff. But let's go back to your beginnings as a networker. Um, you're a fantastic networker today. When did that start for you? Like, you know, when you were a girl, were you the, were you the hostess with the mostest? Like, where did this skill at networking come from? You're going to love this story because I just discovered this about two weeks ago. I was hosting a, well, not hosting a podcast. I was actually being interviewed on a podcast and the woman asked me the same question and I realized that the very first time I monetized my network, I was 15 years old. So what happened was I was aged out of the, let me back up. I was in the foster care system and I was placed in a group home. And there was a flyer on the, on the like in the mailbox. And it said, you know, we're looking for kids to hand out, you know, leaflets in the neighborhood for the local realtor. I called the office and I took the interview and I asked if I could do other projects. And they said, yeah, sure, no problem. What do you think of answering the phones? And I said, sure, I'd love to answer the phones. And that was my first job ever working for the number one realtor in San Jose, California on the weekends from the time I was 15 to 17. I, I completely forgot about that. And that was the first time I monetized my network. So I consider myself an OG. So if people <laughs> don't know what that means, original gangsta. So I've been I was educating my sons on what OG you could be a G and that's just a gangster. That's like, you know, whatever. Still good, but not, you know, and then you're OG. <laughs> yeah, so I'm an OG, Eleanor. Can you believe it? 15 years old. I can. But that's so amazing, you know, and it speaks to like a couple of things, you know, that I'm hearing. So putting, you know, saying, yeah, I'm up to do this. I'm going to try this. And then asking for more. Exactly. You know, like, yeah, which is so huge. Oh my gosh. So that's amazing. All right. So so flash forward to a concept that you developed called the billion dollar Rolodex. Um, you know, tell us first, how, what is a billion dollar Rolodex? And then, and then we'll take it from there. So in this era where we're focused on fans, followers, likes, and subscribers, you know, we get up in the morning and we check our social media feeds and and we're looking to see, you know, you know, our engagement. Most women don't have the core networks that they need to facilitate their goals. So my philosophy is build the Rolodex first, get the Rolodex in order, and then you can worry about all of that other stuff because that's what saved me. So when I was aged out of the foster care system, and, you know, literally they said, you know, you have to go. They put me out on the street at 18. It was my networking skills that saved me every single time. You know, people often wonder, well, how did you get into, you know, the circles? You know, I, I didn't go to Harvard. You know, I didn't, I didn't have, you know, obviously, you know, Ivy League parents, wealthy parents. I didn't have any of that. It was always the networking. So, you know, I worked in Hollywood, Steven Spielberg, Janet Jackson, you know, LL Cool J, every single gig that I landed, it was networking. When I worked in the beauty industry with Paul Mitchell and uh, a company called Regis Hairstylists in North, uh, Northern California, it was all networking. Everything was networking. So 
I just continued throughout my life leveraging that skill set. But when social media sort of was born, you know, I didn't let it go. And I think it's one of the reasons why I have this confidence about social media where a lot of women are insecure because they don't have high metrics. And I've had women metrics shame me and they, they'll say, oh, well, you don't have you know, high metrics. And I say, well, I have, I make a lot of money. I have monetization. <laughs> okay, so. That's right. I have monetization metrics. Okay. okay. I'll, I'll, I'll peg my metrics against your metrics any day. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. So for me, I think that we need to go back to that and we need to free ourselves from this obsession. I mean, I, I, I literally recording a podcast it's called compulsive popularity disorder because it's, it's just too crazy. And, you know, you often talk about the gender equity gap, but there's a gender network gap. And yeah. if we want to fill the gender network gap, I highly, highly, highly recommend every woman forge a billion dollar Rolodex. So there's so, so much embedded in what you just said, um, you know, and I can remember back when I was a journalist and I was writing an article about um, why women don't get access to capital, um, venture capital. And of course, this has been a conversation that's been going on forever. And I can remember interviewing this woman, her name was Lisa Ewing, and she was the I think she was like the head of innovation at the Ewing Kaufman Foundation, which is one of the, the, the largest at the time, I'm not sure if it still is, was like the largest private foundation in the United States. And it had a real focus on innovation and entrepreneurship. So I was talking to her about this and she was like, quite simply, it's a lack of access and specifically for women, a lack of access to networks, to the people and so I love what you're saying, you know, this, this idea of a network gap, it's really profound because it's legit, you know, do you actually have the connections? And I think, you know, what you're highlighting here is this idea that, you know, now we're sort of obsessed with social media and followers and fans and guys, for those of you who have big social media followings, and we're not, we're, we're sort of joking around here, but we're not trying to shame that <laughs> in any way. That's great. Sure, but it's sure. a different type of asset than the core networks that you're talking about. And wouldn't it be amazing if we all had both, if we did have that subscriber base, but we also had those core networks, which I personally believe is where the real money is. Exactly. And I'm glad that you touched on that because oftentimes social media influencers will say, oh, you're just saying that because you don't have, you know, hundreds of thousands of fans, followers, et cetera. But I actually have a fairly large community of 17,000 women on LinkedIn. I have one of the biggest, you know, women's networks on LinkedIn, but my focus is not the 17,000. My focus is actually the 20. 25% conversion rate on the 17,000. And that's yeah. what I like women to focus on. It's the net impact of those numbers because, you know, telling everyone I have 17,000, you know, that, that doesn't mean anything, but let me break it down. You know, 20% landed on my email list, you know, another 10% became clients, you know, like that's more important. Yeah. And I just think sort of energetically too, I can totally relate to what you're talking about. I remember having this kind of shift, um, you know, this, this shift personally, which was, you know, earlier in my business, I was obsessed because I thought I needed to be, I was obsessed with this idea of quote unquote, building my audience, <laughs> you know, and like what that really equated to was getting exposure, making sure that people knew about me, you know, building followers, subscribers, all of that. And I'm not saying that's not important that it, you know, I'm, I'm a pragmatic person as is Anjanita. So we un do understand that there is, that that is um, a dimension that we want to be paying attention to. Are we known? Are, are we able to get out to the people who need to hear about us? But what I will say is every time I focused on that, it, there was a feeling around it that felt quite hollow. And when I really sort of thought through um, instead at having like at building an actual relationship, one person at a time. So for me, it's like building a relationship one reader at a time and one listener at a time and actually having a relationship. And it's weird because you're, 
kind of for, you know, I'm like having these relationships with people that I can't see, <laughs> but that energy and focus, no, I'm going to build the actual relationships and that changed everything. And I think people feel it and you start to, the trust is there. You're attracting the right people. Um, so I can, I can totally relate to what you're saying there. And it's the social capital, not the social media metrics. I think that's, that's the problem because we've, we've moved away from, you know, the social capital where we're, we don't really have a understanding of that, which is what I teach women how to build is the social capital and invest in people because ma relationships mature at different times. You know, you can't, can't like meet someone today and expect them to pay you for your products or services. Yeah, and, and that's totally. the problem with social. Everything is now, you know, today yeah. it has to happen. <laughs> Completely. Oh my gosh. I so love this conversation. So but I, you know, and, and so I'm, I'm so excited we're having this conversation, especially with, you know, our listeners, because, you know, so many of the listeners to this show and the subscribers to my email list, for instance, and just the, the women with whom, you know, I relate to best in the business world, sometimes they have larger social followings, but where their true sort of uh, power is is in their actual professional networks, the people that they know, the impact, influence, power, capital, opportunities, ideas, know-how that they're connected to through their actual professional relationships. Um, so, you know, I'll have people sometimes who I'm working with and they're like, I need to get this lead magnet. I have to build up my Instagram following. And I'm like, girlfriend, you were a chief, you were, you spent 10 years as the chief HR officer in this massive organization. You are so well connected. Um, that's where your power is. What are you doing? Trying to like court followers on Instagram, who cares? You have a major money network, but sometimes people, they aren't sort of making that connection when they get into the world of marketing and business. Why do you think that connection, like, A, have you seen that phenomenon yourself All the time. In, in your work? Yeah. All the time. Because again, you know, we're programmed, right? To go online, go to our social media pages and chase fans, followers, and likes. We're just, we're just programmed to do that. And, and we don't look and see what we have available. And that's really what this is about. It's, it's leveraging the networks that you already have and continuing to build the social capital. Now, if you want to go out and do all those other things, that's fine. You know, I love Instagram. You know, I love posting stories on Instagram, but let's get back to the net impact. Are you making money? You know, are you able to pay your bills? You know, like, like yeah. that's, you know, I think, I think you, you shared this in one of your articles, you know, likes don't pay the bill. <laughs> I know. <laughs> Thank God. Thank God. <laughs> know, right. Exactly. You know, for some people, you know, we won't name names, but some people make, you know, millions, but you know, that's, what is it? 1% of uh, social media influencers. Yeah. So I just think it's it's important that we look at this, you know, look at this issue and see it for what it really is and how it's hurting us. Yeah, because, agreed. You know, there, there are a lot of problems in the world. You know, there are women hurting right now. There are women that are still in economic shock. You know, they've had to depend on the government. They've had to take a job they didn't want to take. And that in my opinion, could be solved if we leverage our networks. Yes. So, you know, I'm going to, and you know, and we're going to get in a moment to, you know, your concept and theory and work around this idea of feminine principles of networking. But I was having a conversation recently. I, I don't think, you know, this is an area of, of just kind of emerging commitment for me, which is this idea of bringing more of the sort of feminine, uh, the sacred feminine uh, approach into how we do business. 
And when you think about it, I, when I think about feminine creative energy, right? Um, that is really about drawing. It's about resourcefulness and it's about drawing from what you have in the same way that like a wave gathers energy. When you watch waves and the tremendous energy that they have, they're like drawing their energy from within themselves. Um, and I think about what you're saying, like, look at the network you have, look at the connections that you have rather than always this idea of this sort of hunter style mentality, which is let's get out there and just get new, 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 and more, more, more people all the time. Again, there's a part of that that is important where we are pragmatic, but let's also take a look at this feminine approach, which is building from what we have, leveraging from what we have, relying on the relationships that we already have to support us and nurture the business that we're building. I think it's just so huge, right? Absolutely. Yeah. So let's talk then about, you know, the story of just this plucky, resourceful 15 year old Anjanita <laughs> monetizing the network, you know, and, and the thing is like, I've known you for a few years now. I can 100% see that whole thing going down. Like I can, <laughs> I can 100% see that situation going down, which I love. I'll totally answer the phones. Like what, what more, are there other projects that I can do? Like just kind of I got to dress ways. up. Got Listen, to dress up. <laughs> I know. know. Anjanita doesn't have her camera on, but um, yeah, <laughs> it's I so love, hilarious. Love, you gotta love, go. love dressing up. Yes, looking like a million bucks. So, okay, so let's talk about this idea of monetizing the network. So, what we've so I think point number one that we're trying to we've kind of communicated in this conversation is look fans, followers, subscribers, that's all good, but let's not overlook where the real money is. And the hypothesis that we're putting forward is the real money is in the actual relationships, the solid connections that we have. That's where most of the economic opportunity is. And we are not looking there. Um, and then that not looking at those relationships has been exacerbated by this influencer culture that we're creating, which is all around, you know, building up lots of fans who will never pay you. So let's talk about there. Okay. How do we, if the real money is in the connections that we have, we're also not necessarily monetizing it. Um, so I wanted to kind of ask you about that, you know, what, how does a person monetize their network? You know, what does that look like? What kind of tips or, or ideas do you have around getting people to think more about monetizing the network? Absolutely. So I'm going to piggyback on what you shared earlier regarding the, the feminine, because, you know, networking is a male sport. You know, men sort of, you know, invented networking. It, you know, the, the boys club, we've heard that before. And I think women struggle with networking because they lack the confidence in who they really are. And the first step to monetizing your network is being really sure of who you are and leveraging your assets. So if you walk into a room and you're not sure and you're trying to be something you're not, and you know, it, it just, it just won't work. And so that's this, the, the first step, like you have to have that level of confidence to magnetize people, to persuade people to, you know, invest in you and your ideas. So that's the, the first step. And then the second one is powerful communication. And this is why I love Eleanor. Okay. Let me, let me just <laughs> to say, this is why I love Queen Bee because she is a stickler about communication. And I think in this social media era, we're so focused on the content, 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 but women aren't communicating and they don't communicate powerfully. Again, if you want to magnetize people, you have to communicate powerfully. So that's the, the second tip. Yeah. The third one is money-making conversations learning how to take mindless chit chat and turn it into a money-making conversation. So that way you ask, you know, you're asking the right questions, you're listening, which a lot of people don't do. They're not listening and you're engaged with the other person. 
So you're, you're listening for clues, you're open-minded and you'll see, okay, you know what, how can I leverage this relationship? And it doesn't mean that it's going to happen today. It might happen a year from now, but when you're in that conversation, you spot the lucrative opportunity. So for me, those are sort of the three core tips. I have six in my, you know, I was going to say my arsenal. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> those are the top three. Yeah. And, and honestly, you know, I think, um, I think people should really go and check out um, and, and check out the work and learn from you around this I- idea of cultivating that billion dollar Rolodex. Um, because yeah, these are just three, but there are others. And I want to take the time to kind of, um, go through these three, because I think they're so, they're so important. So let's start with this idea of lacking confidence in who you are. And this one I think is so huge. And I, this one is really huge. And I kind of want to take this in this other direction. So I can, I feel like there's two different types of confidence. Like when I look at my own sort of career and evolution, I, um, I can totally see how my confidence in who I am has evolved and developed. So, you know, I remember being in so many situations, uh, earlier in my career where I would get in, I would get myself into, and I know that listeners, and you've probably experienced this self, this yourself, you know, you've got some skills, you've got some talents, you've got some pluck, you've, you know, you've got some luck and you get yourselves into these rooms, you know, um, these rooms where maybe there are some powerful people in that room. Maybe there are, you know, people who are connected to really cool resources, or maybe you're in a room where there's there are potential opportunities here on the table. And I remember initially, my initial level of confidence was, I am gonna trust my skills. I'm gonna trust myself that I can adapt to what's going on in this room. And I can, I can kind of adapt, I can mirror, um, I can do all of that and just fit in here. And that was like level one of confidence, the ability where I felt like I could fit in. And the, and that was great, but I also found in that kind of environment, I also found it exhausting. I started getting tired of fitting in, you know, Mm -hmm. and I felt like fitting in was great, but I always would feel nervous. And I would also, also actually be kind of sweaty. (laughs) (laughs) Just being totally uh, like honest, like literally I was like, I, uh, but I would, I had that. And that was like that that was that biological reaction to feeling like I wasn't safe. Mm. Right. And I, what I had to learn as I sort of, as you know, I I was, it, it bothered me a lot. And I was like, why don't I feel safe? And I realized I didn't feel safe because I felt like I had to switch. I had to do like this whole context switching in order to feel like I belonged there. And so that change that started to change. Now I'm incapable of concept (laughs) context switching. Like I am exactly the same everywhere. And it's funny because I'm in a lot of rooms where that's not, you know, um, somebody being very straight up and blunt and direct, like me speaking in the same way I would speak here with you is the same way that I would around a boardroom table. Um, that has been really different, but that is a different level of confidence where you feel I am who I am. Yep. I'm totally worthy of being here and I'm going to show up in this way. Yep. Yep. You know, can you relate to that? Like, do you think other women deal with that situation of like that level one confidence? I feel like I can't be who I am, but I'm going to be able to blend in, you know, but you're still not being yourself. Exactly. And people talk about imposter syndrome And I think this is, you know, why networking doesn't work is because you feel like you're an imposter and other people feel it. And I'll give you an example. Everyone loves the story. So I was on a Zoom and uh, this was a a Los Angeles based event. And you know that I'm in London. So this event started, you know, morning time in LA, but for me, it was, it was pretty late at night. So the last session was about 10 PM. And so we were in breakout sessions and this was a high level event. So there were people that, you know, like 
sold companies for 50 million. Like they, they were like, you know, celebrities, very famous people. And we were in breakout sessions. So I enter the, the room and there's one man in the room and we're waiting for five people to join the room, but, but they didn't show up. So I asked him, you know, how are you? You know, I said, you know, and uh, tell me about you. And he said, oh, you know, I'm, I'm here because I'm, I'm coming out of the tech world and I'm starting a health business. And oh, I said, tell me about that. And he said, oh, well, I used to uh, work as a VC. And I said, oh, so you, you helped rate, you know, raise capital. And he said, yes. And I said, how much money? And he said, three quarters of a billion <laughs> now. And I said, 750 million. And he said, yes. I said, oh, I said, a setup street. <laughs> I said, have you ever thought about teaching people how to raise capital? I said, it's one of the biggest issues that women face, you know, you know, with capital. And he was explaining to me the, the angel round and the seed round and, you know, how unicorns are formed. And so I said, are you on LinkedIn? And he said, yes. And I said, okay, I'm going to connect with you on LinkedIn. Can we have a meeting? And I'd love to learn more about you. And he said, sure, no problem. I connected with him on LinkedIn and I had one minute. I made sure we were, you know, <laughs> that I, I knew exactly who he was. And I said goodbye. And um, that was the end of the story. Seven minutes, $750 million VC. He's now in my billion dollar Rolodex. This is what I want to teach women how to do. Yeah. I didn't go to Stanford. He's, you know, his business partner is friends with Peter Thiel. Listen, <laughs> listen. Yeah. Who I, uh, who just, who is a crazy thinker. Yeah. I love, I, uh, a lot of people have a lot of issues with Peter Thiel, but I, I get it. Um, you might not love his politics, but you gotta love his brain. So that's, that's what, what I want to teach women how to do. Yeah. You know, seven minutes, $750 million venture capital. Yeah. And every single day, you know, you just yes. never know. You, you need to be prepared. I didn't go into, oh my gosh, I didn't go to Stanford. Oh my gosh, you know, who am I? Oh my gosh. Yeah. I didn't go into that. I yeah. treated him like everyone else. And also because, you know, as a former journalist, I can attest like to ask good questions, you have to be present and you have to be very comfortable with what you know, and you don't know yep. you, you know, and, and not feel so in, you know, it's that level of acceptance of who you are and confidence in who you are that allows you to make those connections that allows you to ask the questions that other people would be too self-conscious to ask. It's really powerful. Okay. So that's amazing. So I love, you know, I, I love that number one, really cultivating that deep confidence in who you are. So you can show up and be present, you know? So the second one you talked about is this idea of powerful communication. And I think you sort of shared an example of that, but when you like, when you think if you were to take it further, what are one or two other things that you think are sort of the hallmark of powerful communication as it relates to forming a billion dollar Rolodex? The one minute introduction, which I call the million dollar introduction, because oftentimes women don't know how to answer the question. So what do you do? They are self-conscious, they fumble, they're insecure. And, you know, you miss opportunities. If you, if you haven't nailed, you know I, know, I know some people call it the elevator pitch. If you haven't nailed your pitch, you're going to miss out on opportunities. And I remember traveling and I would sit on the plane and the, the number one question was, you know, so where are you going? What do you do? You know? and, yes. yes. And, and I would answer the question. And before you know it, you know, they were asking me about my business. They were referring me to people, you know, and um, exchanging phone numbers. I, I think it's underrated. So what yeah. do you do? I think we, we really need to focus on that and nail it. You know, so that when you hop on a Zoom and, you know, Mr. $750 million, by the way, like, <laughs> I don't want people asking me for money because people are going to be like, oh, can you give me some money? Can you get me some money? Um, learn how to build. I can teach you how to build your billion dollar Rolodex so you can go out and, and, uh, and leverage um, your network to, uh, to raise capital. 
Yeah. But you really need to hone that one minute because it will serve you throughout yes. your entire life. And I think, you know, and that it's kind of sequential, right? Because that ability to stand in your power, say who you are and what you do and understand that it's enough, you know, cause you can totally, you want to hear people's deep seated and, and insecurities, ask them what they do and see how they start to get, it's very, they get so uncomfortable and it's a yep. very human thing. Yep. Um, but that ability, right. I think that's number one. If you, when you truly own who you are and accept yep. that and feel deeply confident in that and feel safe also in who you are, you know, and then it's like that allows the ability. Okay. Now it's not just the words like, you know, to have the words, but to just be able to state it confidently and clearly, you know, without apologizing or stumbling. So that's like the second part, powerful communication. Okay. So let's talk about the third one, which I love money-making conversations versus mindless chit chat. <laughs> oh, <laughs> so tell me, uh, tell me about that. Well, I think, you know, we're, we're great at talking, right? Women, you know, we love talking, we love chatting, but we forget to strategize and leverage those conversations. And so for me, you know, if I'm, I, I can, you know, I, I love talking, you know, but I'm always listening for an opportunity. I'm like, my, my, my ears are open. Like, you know, I was trying to think of the cartoon character, but I can't, I can't think of it, but there's a cartoon character where the ears sort of enlarge. So I was, I was, uh, I, I just had a flashback, but um, yes. <laughs> I know I, I, I uh, that it's on the tip of my memory too. Is it Dumbo? Yeah. Yes, that's <laughs> it. That's <laughs> it. Dumbo. Okay. Exactly. See? Dumbo, Dumbo. But yeah, so, so it's, it's, it's listening for opportunities and then driving those conversations in a way that empowers empowers you, but also the other person to share their resources, their ideas, you know, referrals, introductions, you know, that sort of thing. So I, I see a lot of women miss out because they don't want to pick up the phone and have a conversation. They're happy to chat but, but a real conversation and, and that's related to sales, you yeah. know, because women don't like to sell, but I'll tell you one thing, if you truly learn how to network strategically and effectively making the sale is no longer a challenge. It's, it's not so be well, because the trust relationship yeah. is there. And also the, you know, you've been listening. And so you, there's a legitimate opportunity. You're not trying to force anything. They have a genuine need exactly. that you can fulfill. Yeah, exactly. I, I agree. Yeah, exactly. You know, it's so interesting. One of the things that I've observed, and I think this really anchors into this idea of money-making conversations versus mindless chit-chat. Sometimes I roll my eyes, <laughs> roll them hard when I hear a lot of people, usually this is put into some form of an inspirational quote, which uh -oh. is memorialized for two seconds on Instagram or God forbid Pinterest. And it's something like collaboration over competition, you know, and there's a lot of this and there's a lot of, you know, um, that women are, you know, that we collaborate so much and all of that. And I appreciate the sentiment and I 100% agree that for millennia, women have um, collaborated for our survival and for to thrive, you know, but I'm going to call BS for a moment because in order to truly collaborate, there's always a give and take. There's the providing of support and help, whether that's emotional support, spiritual support, or practical support. Like I'm going to make some introductions for you. Um, and then there's the take, which is asking for the help. And after coaching so many women and, you know, um, leading communities and all of that, the number one thing that I see that I think can really hold women entrepreneurs back. And I have 100% been in this category myself is forgetting to ask for help, feeling that I'm unhelpable, feeling that, oh, there's no way that these guys have something that I could benefit from. Like I just see every day women put themselves beyond help. Like they don't even think of asking for help. And so they can't collaborate 
if you're not trying to actually ask for, if you, you know, you can't collaborate if you're not actually um, receiving something, if you're just trying to give all the time. So this idea of in these communication, in these money-making conversations, what I'm hearing you clearly say is the connection is there. You're looking at sharing resources, but you're also being very focused as at the same time as, is there something here that can help me? Like, it's not just the give, it's also the take. And women have a problem asking for what they want, which is an, a, another reason why I created the 30 day ask for what you want challenge. And it's essentially a challenge where I get all of my clients to literally commit to 30 days and they have to ask every day, ask, oh, you know, for water, amazing. ask for you know, a ride somewhere, ask to change their seat on the plane. Like every single day, you have to ask for what you want, small, medium, or large. And it exercises the asking muscle because it's, again, one of the reasons why, you know, we have a difficult time networking because we're not asking. We're, we're, and also what I find is some women are givers and then some women are takers, but we're mm -hmm. not aligned. Yeah. And I've been in situations where I see women giving, 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 and there's no reciprocation. Yeah. And I've seen, you know, women taking, 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 and they have zero, okay, zero <laughs> to offer. <laughs> and it's horrible. Yes. It's there's got to be that balance. So um, I think anybody who's listening to this, you know, can really see this is a different level of conversation that you're having, you know, around this idea of networking. And I, um, we're going to share a little bit later, like where people can go, but I, I do think a great place for people to start. Um, Anjanita has this fantastic event called networking in stilettos. So go check out Anjanita on LinkedIn and you will see that she has an event called networking in stilettos. And I think that's a really great place to, you know, to interact with Anjanita Anita and start to see, start to, you know, get integrate some of this wisdom, it, you know, ladies, you can just listen to it, or you can actually start to integrate this into your everyday business practices and find that you have these incredible resources. It's just their lazy assets right now, because we're not leveraging them effectively. So I think, you know, that's really important. So I want to get to, you know, we've had the um, pleasure of working together in the past. And one of the things that I wanted to kind of ask you about is this idea of positioning, you know, and how, so like why that's so important. Cause you get that not everybody gets how important positioning is, you know, but you really do. And I, I would love for you to kind of share a little bit about, um, about positioning, like, and why, you know, how that's impacted you as you have, as you are, you know, impacting thousands of women with the work that you're doing around cultivating billion dollar networks, Rolodexes. And networks. I love that. And networks. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right. They're both. <laughs> both. Well, you know, we, I, I shared this with you earlier. For me, it was the culture, the, the copycat culture, you know, where everyone looks the same, everyone's doing the same thing. And I am so different. And, you know, a la Peter Thiel, I'm a contrarian and I own it and I love it. But I found myself in situations where I would hire, you know, very successful mentors and they, they tried to dumb me down. And I, I just, I just, I don't want to say I hated it, but mm -hmm. some, on some level I did. And I was drawn to you because you were so unapologetic, you were brilliant in your work and your, obviously your journalism background and just the way you structured your business. And I thought, okay, I want this woman to be my strategist. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, everything that I had created you know, that, that we're talking about was truly, you know, born during that time when, when we started, because I, I launched Monetize Your Network. And I remember when we were in Nova Scotia, you brought me to Nova yes. Scotia, by the way, you brought me to Nova yes, Scotia. Yes, exactly. And we we're proud just, to host you. I know. <laughs> and I, I loved it. And I, I wore my, my tall boots and, and leather coats and 
was it was cold, but but it I loved cold. I loved it. And also, I went to the dinosaur museum, which was really cool. Was- <laughs> <laughs> I had to add that. But yeah, I mean, we we worked on on the business. I you know that is the business today, and it's it's a true reflection of who I am. And that's what I love about the work that you do because the positioning is so important. And when you hone in on your positioning, category of one, like it's a no brainer. Like, like people can't touch you. It's irritating, you know, cause people, people still copy me. People still, you know, try to do what I'm doing, but it's, it's not easy to copy me now. Like, like, yeah. like there, there's a distinct brand. There's a strong worldview. You know, everyone knows I mean business. And I, and I think also because I can come across as materialistic or that this work is playful. It's not serious. But the way that it's packaged, it's rooted in, in substance and style. And so I'm very yeah. happy about that. I'm, I'm just, I'm just so happy. I love my business. I love, you know, where it's at. I love where it's going. I just love it. I, yeah. I can't thank you enough. <laughs> uh, well, and I think, you know, and that's like, uh, that, that really is, you know, about this idea of like, um, a collaboration on certain parts of that business where it's like, it's like a thought partnership, you know? And I yep. think, that's so important. You know, I think in working with women entrepreneurs, sometimes in this industry and in the industry that I'm in, it can be sort of like a, a guru student relationship. <laughs> and I'm like, nobody I want to work with would ever put themselves in that position. You know what I mean? I think most of the people that I would want to work with, it's like this meeting of the minds, you know, with us and them and, and that we're kind of talking through things and thinking about things. And, um, it's, yeah, I see it as like a meeting of the minds and that's the kind of work and, you know, that I want to do and the kind of people that we want to work with my colleagues and I at Safi. So yeah, I love that. And I think, you know, I think there's this other thing that really comes through in your work, which is this idea of gender equity. Like Mm -hmm. it is about the making money. It is about the billion dollar Rolodex, but to your point of the network gap, it is addressing a really pervasive issue that impacts jet global gender equity, which is this network gap. So it's huge. Listen, I could talk, right? Yeah. Right. (laughs) I I love because it's stilettos, it's glitz, it's glam, but at the end of the day, I'm solving a real world problem and I'm an OG (laughs) and a total OG. Listen, I could, I have so loved this conversation. I could talk to you for hours, but let's talk about where other people can talk to you for hours. Um, <laughs> where can they, where can they go to learn more about you um, and connect with you and sort of get into your world and embrace some of this uh, worldview that you have? Where should we send them? Femglobal500.com. Femglobal500.com. Love it. Anjanita. Thank you so much, my friend. I so appreciate our conversation and appreciate Thank the work you you're so doing. Thank you so much. I so, I so, so, so appreciate the work that you're doing. And, and, you know, I just absolutely, I'm going to say it. I just absolutely love you. I love oh, you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> no, thank you so much. It was fun.